this. For police officers to take our time to waste the time of an entire nation talking about they never heard of police brutality, they don't know what black people are talking about, they can't prove it. We know in Detroit, any time a black person is uh, brutalized by the police, he goes into court and he's arrested for assault and battery. Now the basic issue is so simple and nobody will even touch it because you're afraid to touch it. You are deliberately trying to evade the issue. Everybody is talking about Reverend Clegg, uh, Reverend Clegg, if you can hear me. The thing is that in the United States, we are engaged in a power struggle between black people and white people. You don't want to say it. You don't want to hear it said. You want to talk to somebody else. You got a nut sitting there someplace who says he's a police official who hasn't said one thing all night. There is a power struggle going on, and black people have decided they're not going to tolerate oppression any longer. Now, police brutality is a very deliberate thing. It's a part of American life. America has decided that black people are to be kept in subjection. It's an army of occupation that the white power structure keeps in the black ghetto. We know, now don't talk about they are, they are, how, what is the internet, how what it is. We know what it is. Uh, Reverend Clegg, Reverend Clegg, let me ask you a question. Knows it. White people know it. Throughout America, white people know what white policemen are doing. Let me ask you a question, Professor uh, Reverend Clay. You know what it is. Everybody knows what it is. Now, black people are not going to permit police brutality to go on. Reverend Clay. City in America. Reverend Clay. In almost a hundred cities race violence last summer. If police brutality continues, we'll have it in 200 cities next summer. Now, white people know that. Something has got to be done about it. We are wasting time. We are waiting. Let's come to the issue. I black can't seem to get to Reverend Clegg's ear, and without black seeming to, see, to seem irreverent or disrespectful, we're going to shift to Philadelphia, where the chief of police of Detroit is in uh, the Philadelphia studio, uh, Chief Passell. Uh, yes. can, you, uh, can you add something uh, to this dialogue, Mr. Parcell? Yes, You're the I'm president, not... I believe, of the Detroit Police Officers Association. Are you on leave from your duties as, uh, as chief? I'm not the chief of police. I'm the head of the Police Officers Association. I stand corrected. Please go ahead. I'd certainly like to answer the Reverend Clegg. I think there's been a many uh, self-appointed leaders uh, throughout the Negro community who has stated that they represent the Negro. And I think it's a proven fact that in these areas where they had a vote for police officers, and uh, right in Watts, right after the riot there, they had voted on a pension system for the Los Angeles police officers, and it collected 75% out of the Watts area. In Detroit, where there was over 600,000 Negroes, very few of these people participated in the riot. And I think that in the next week, there's going to be a committee of Negro leaders, business leaders, stand up and make a statement, make a combined statement, that no one speaks for them. Rat Brown don't speak for them. Reverend Clegg doesn't uh, speak for Purcell, them. Officer uh, Purcell, would you address yourself more specifically to the problem in Detroit rather than the problem elsewhere? Is yes. There... I think that the Reverend Clegg himself uh, states that the, he speaks for the people of Detroit. I have to say that in Detroit, that there were over 600,000 Negroes in Detroit, and certainly they did not participate in any riots. Reverend Clegg has stated that the only thing that the riot proved was that the Negroes could uprise, and it did not prove anything because it was fought to a standstill. And I think that he made a statement that if he had help from other Negro leaders like Carmichael and Rap Brown, that certainly it would not be a standstill and they would have won. Now I ask him, what did the Negro community want? The Negro community has come forward to the police department, Detroit, and asked for more police protection. They want protection. They have asked for more community programs. And I'm happy to say that in our letter to the police commissioner, we too have requested more police community relations. And I think that they are about to set up a storefront uh, system in Detroit where patrolmen will be involved in it, where they will be talking to the people in the community. But at the same time, when we are charged with defending ourselves, certainly we are here.
in defense of the police department. Uh, We're here in defense of all policemen. Because Reverend Clegg, uh, uh, we can, you, you I, are, we can, excuse me, Reverend Mr. Clegg. Well, I'd like to answer to Reverend also. He is the one that advocated that the police department join rifle clubs so they could get superior weapons to kill black people during the next revolution. Now, I, I would I'm like to answer, answer him. That. Reverend now, Clegg. Reverend Clegg, uh, let me just to understand the basic issue, which is still being avoided in Detroit. You're avoiding my questions, uh, Reverend Clegg. Detroit has advocated uh, superior weapons, superior weapons for for black for the uh, white police department, the army of occupation. He has advocated nine million dollars, and I'd like to have a witness say something about the Stoner rifle, which is the most deadly weapon ever conceived that is now being purchased in huge quantities by the Detroit Police Department. And I'd like to ask Reverend Charles Butler, who is a pastor of the New Calvary Baptist Church and the chairman of the Defense uh, Committee of the Interfaith Emergency Council, to say a word on this stoner rifle which the Detroit Police Department is getting I'd like together. to answer him on something he's talking about. Wait just a minute. Let, let's get the, uh, the Reverend's colleague here. But Reverend, please uh, keep that little thing in your ear. I'm having difficulty asking you questions. But go ahead and let the gentleman comment about the weapon. Grab him, Butler. Talk, talk about that weapon that they get to get. One of the reasons the heat is raised in Detroit and will probably remain high is the stoner rifle requested for purchase by the Detroit Police Department. This rifle is a combat assault weapon, caliber 223 extremely accurate, that can be fired as a semi or as a fully automatic weapon with a muzzle velocity of 3,300 feet per second and a range of a mile and a half. It has been demonstrated as capable of piercing incredible thickness of both soft steel and masonry. The bullet begins to tumble upon impact with target, boring, tearing, shocking, mutilating, maiming, and killing, leaving gaping holes in its target. A soldier recently returned from Vietnam told me this week that in the zone where he was, the stoner rifle now in use there was considered so deadly that it was fired only on orders from an officer of captain's rank or higher. I am therefore deeply distressed that a civil agency wants a combat assault weapon and would like to know why. I am also distressed at the destructive power of the stoner rifle or other high velocity rifles and the likelihood that many innocent people can be killed or permanently maimed by its use, even people locked in their homes, since the rifle will shoot through masonry. Uh, Reverend, perhaps we can ask the uh, Detroit police uh, officer who is in Philadelphia a little later uh, the answer to your question of why they're doing this. But well, meanwhile, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to interrupt you for just a minute to ask uh, Dr. Reese, uh, in view of the fact that Detroit is a very familiar neighborhood to him, his headquarters are in Ann Arbor, uh, about this in terms of, of weapons, uh, and then I want to go uh, for, a, for a reaction to Dr. Poussant about this whole issue of, of uh, lethal weapons and non-lethal weapons. Uh, do they, do they ab achieve any, any salubrious objective? I doubt whether an armed police in the sense of the stoner rifle is what we want in a democratic society. I doubt whether we want to calculate a policy of policing that is based on the use of weapons against the citizenry. And I certainly, for one, uh, would question seriously the basis on which such a policy is made. Dr. Poussaint, have you uh, got some reactions of your own to this kind of, of technique? Uh, yes, I have uh, some reactions to that. I think it seems that police are more concerned with uh, uh, putting down riots and uh, enforcing law and don't seem to be concerned with some of the causes that are leading to some of the distress uh, and to the riots. Uh, so they react with sort of a, a repressive measures, and we're going to uh, suppress more people, and we're going to kill them, and so on. Now, I think this whole question of these new weapons that police uh, are getting uh, is getting quite out of hand, and I think in particular, uh, besides these rifles, the chemical uh, mace, which is a tear gas spray that's been purchased in large quantities by many 
uh, police departments around the country. Before we go into the techniques and, and technicalities of MACE, I want to interrupt to ask Mr. Parcell in Philadelphia, the president of the Detroit Poli Police Officers Association, if he has any a uh, thing that he wants to say about this stoner rifle uh, in Detroit, uh, the question that was raised by the Negro clergyman. Uh, uh, can, you, can you hear me, Mr. Purcell? Yes, I'd like to just comment on the last gentleman that said that the police are getting more interested in, in uh, riots and crime rather than uh, in the causes. I want to tell this gentleman that the police officers, it's not his job for causes. We are supposed to be fighting crime and the riots or whatever the situation is. I think if we were allowed to do that and let other people handle the problem. But I have to go along with this rifle. They assume that we have hundreds of rifles. We are only asking for 150 for a specialized crew because we have no way of fighting snipers other than a specialized crew, special trained and under a command and we need something like this. Mr. Parcell, let me, uh, I, I don't want you to, uh, I want you to keep right on it, but I want to interrupt to interject something that I uh, was informed uh, about the other day, and that is this, that in 23 riot cities uh, that were studied meticulously uh, by the Kerner Commission on Urban Disorders and others, so far there has not been one proved death due to civilian sniping. Now, that isn't to say that there wasn't sniping. I would like to answer you well, on that. Now, wait just a minute, uh, Mr. Harrington. I well, was I'd talking like to, to answer Mr. Why Parcell. Did they bury the well, captain, the fire the, captain when, in uh, Detroit. Well, just a minute, Mr. Harrington. I was asking him a specific question about uh, sniping. Well, when you say when you say proof, I mean, has, this is a whole problem with sniping. This was a warlike condition that we got into. We certainly did not want to get into this. We were not prepared for it. Consequently, we are asking for these rifles. We do not, we want to prevent trouble. We're not asking, he said we're out here trying to kill black people. We're trying to save everybody's people. We're not out here to kill anybody. And we need some defense. I think that the, the people have a demand for protection of property in their life. We're not out here to kill people. Now, I was asked, isn't 43 people enough? And uh, I said, it's too many. I know. Like, well, how about the uh, fellow that uh, is arming himself towards the police? No one seems to mention here that these black militant civil rights groups are arming themselves today with uh, automatic weapons. They have shotguns. They are building stockpiles of Molotov cocktails. They have all other assorted homemade weapons that they have made, all to direct at the police. They have one idea. Kill Whitey. Kill the white Mr. devil. Kill uh, the police. Mr. Patrolman Kowaleski, let me ask you this. Uh, as you know, members of the National Rifle Association uh, are not only encouraged to have weapons of various kinds, uh, but it's made easy for them to get weapons under the auspices of the federal government. Uh, would you say that they should be treated in a different way than, uh, than black citizens in terms of access to weapons? I don't see the connection between a National Rifle Association, of which I am a member and of which I say is a highly respected organization, if people got weapons from the Rifle Association, they did it under false colors. They falsified records. They falsified government records. And I, if I am not mistaken, that this can be proven, these people can be prosecuted for falsifying these records, in which they should. What is their purpose and their object and their reason for getting these automatic weapons? Not because the police are getting them? They want them to use against us. Do you have I any would like to tell you about the black police arming them, people arming themselves? Mr. Morgan, themselves? I wonder whether I might ask Mr. Kowalski. Uh, of course. Question. Chime right. Uh, this is Pro Professor Reese wants to ask you a question, uh, Patrolman Kowalski. Can you hear him? Yes, sir. I wonder why you think the people in Newark would want to arm against you. Why would they want to arm against me? Yes. You. I can give you a very good reason. If this TV camera can pick this up, here it is. Get the devil. Get the white devil. Get the man that represents the white power structure. Here's another article. The Wops want race war. Kill the white racist policeman. Uh, numerous other things here, if you want me to mention them, will say here. Now we've got to put the, get these four-legged and two-legged beasts. We know none of them of the brothers and sisters are going to stand for this dog business. Well, what's the motive behind this sort of, uh, what's the motive behind this sort of propaganda, Mr. Kovaleski? I'll tell you what it is, to stir up the hostility between the police and the members of the minority group. 
you saw two perfect examples here tonight of why there is hostility toward the police. Just take one good long look at Reverend Clee when he says that we are the enemy, that we are the invader. And he, this is the man that says here that white policemen are the ones who are enforcing the laws for the white power structure. Let what me is ask Reverend Clee going to do Mr. when he gets, What's Reverend Clee going to do? Mr. Kowalewski, let me ask you a question. Black power ahead, I'd, like, I'd, like to know, I'd like to know from Mr. Kowalewski, number one, if he knows of any case in the black community where there are automatic weapons. Do I know of any case? Yes. Wasn't it recently that we just rounded up 15 people in the city of Newark for a, an arsenal of uh, automatic weapons? I don't believe automatic? so. You don't believe no, so? No, I, I don't would believe like so. Why don't you read the Newark Evening News? I do, I do. I read it very closely. Except when you're in there, Mr. Mr. Kerbin. I read it very closely. Mr. Kerbin, I would I'd, like I'd to like ask you a question. Mr. Kerbin, I'd like to Kerbin, also what would you do ask if Mr. I gave you this file here that's filled with hundreds of people that have been locked up for carrying guns recently? I'd, I'd like to ask hundreds you another question, Mr. Kowalewski. All right. Do you believe that there has ever been a case of police brutality against a black citizen in the city of Newark? Now, that all depends on what you consider to be police brutality. <laughs> physical, I'm going to answer your question. Physical abuse of I'm a citizen in the city. Uh, physical abuse in the city. Now, listen, if I was to say that... Do you believe that there has case, ever been a case? An isolated let me, case Let me tell you brutality? one little story. Let Good, me tell like you one little story. Brutality let me tell you one little story, Mr. Kowalewski. There was a woman by the name of Ida Brown. She was arrested by two police officers and charged with assaulting them. In Newark? In Newark. She was Negro. She was brought to trial. In a conversation during the trial, a prosecutor heard these police officers talk about how they had rigged this story against this woman. He removed himself from the case and took the witness stand himself and testified as to what he had heard. The case was dismissed. The interesting thing is that these two police officers have still to today not had charges brought against them for perjury or either departmental charges. I, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, Mr. Kerbin, I'll answer that. I don't know about the departmental charges, but I know that uh, as a result of that particular incident... Were, were there police... perjury charges filed against well, these listen, police that's officers? Well, up to the county prosecutor. It's not up to the North Police. What do you mean it's up to the North Police? I said it's not up to the North Police. Why isn't it up to the North Police? Do you think the they court. should still be on the police the force? Court. If it's they could to... rig a story against a citizen it's and then bring them into attorney. court? This woman was convicted in municipal court, and she had to win this case on appeal. Yeah. If this prosecutor had not been willing, in fact, to admit that he heard these men say these things, she still would have been convicted in, in the higher court. Let me say this, Mr. Kerbin. To admit that there are, to say that there aren't isolated cases of police brutality would be a bold-faced lie. Let me, now, let me tell you another story. There are isolated cases let, let me of tell you another brutality. story, Mr. Kowalewski. Make this one brief, you know, Mr. Kerwin, because right. I want to get to Mr. Harrington, who I rather rudely during, interrupted a During the ago. rebellion in the city of Newark, I was asked to meet with the governor of New Jersey, Governor Richard Hughes. After the meeting, he pulled me aside and said to me, you know, Bob, I heard that the police are out to get you. I want to give you my card in case you run into anybody that's going to do anything to you and tell them that you met with me and you know me. What about that, where a governor, in fact, can hear that police officers are out to get someone in the community? Could that be because your plants went to the governor and made this complaint? Like you have set up. Uh, I don't have any plants, Mr. Kowalewski. Uh, listen, I don't Mr. have any Kirvin, plants. Don't give me that. Mr. I'll Harrington, give you what the facts are, buddy. Mr. Harrington, uh, I, I interrupted you a moment ago. I yeah, hope it wasn't completely off the train of thought. Do you have something that you want to come in with now? Yes, I had about 15 things if I had the <laughs> chance to come back and say them. But uh, now that I got the mic, why, well, I'd like to say all of them. Uh, number one, in the city of Philadelphia here, a colored man came forward and squealed on RAM. On uh, what, sir? RAM. It's a colored organization. RAM. A revolutionary action movement. movement. Now, this organization had hired him to shoot and kill the police commissioner, the mayor of Philadelphia, the district attorney of Philadelphia. And he pointed out to the police and to the FBI where the potassium cyanide was stashed away so that when they started the riot, they were going to poison 1,500 policemen. Now, I want to ask uh, this reverend over in Detroit, 
who is the leader of the colored people in Detroit? Because I have a book here, uh, Reader's Digest, which is a very respected book, and it states that the, the New York Times said that the executive secretary of the NAACP in the city of Detroit condemns the police because they didn't put force into the riot area soon enough. Now, do they want force or don't they want force? I also hear about this high-powered rifle and so forth. In this same book, it tells you how they do it in the other countries. In the other countries, they arm their police riot squads with machine guns. They have special uh, lead capes in England and all over the world. They're giving their police the tools to do the job. Now, the people have to make their mind up. Now, let's Do they ask, want riots? Let me finish. Now, I didn't interrupt you. <laughs> well, I'm sort of, I'm sort of in a in a tough spot here, well, Mr. Harrington. I know you are, but you're yeah. always shortcutting us. Now, let us have our say, and we might as well go. I don't think we're shortcutting you, Mr. Harrington. And if you don't mind, we're going down to Chief uh, uh, Jenkins well, I'm in Atlanta I'll tell you at this that particular because I don't point. Think you're giving us a fair shake. We'll get back to you, Chief Jenkins. Can you? Pull some of these strings together uh, from your well, point of view and, and uh, uh, get some balance out of this discourse? Well, I'd like to say at this point that I regret that more police chiefs do not appear on this program tonight because I don't think they've been well represented. Now, this program, I think, has emphasized that this nation has a very serious problem that we must find the answer to it. Now, the first order of business must always be law and order and justice for all. Now, the causes must be identified, and they must be corrected. And that is exactly what we are determined to do here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'd like for Reverend Williams to speak on that also. Uh, thank you very much, Chief. Um, I, I've listened to the dialogue which has been going on here, and I, I know that the gentlemen in Newark have some problems, but I don't think we've been talking about what really concerns us. One of the things that I'd like us to get back on, and this is the question of white fear, and the fact that the police department in the city of Detroit is arming itself with the stoner rifle seems to me to uh, lend support to the claim of the minorities in that city that they have something to fear. Uh, I certainly share the opinion of somebody who said this is not the sort of thing we want in a democratic society. Uh, now. One of the things that we've got to understand is that white citizens do not have the same reason to complain as Negroes do against the police department. Why is that so, Reverend? This is so because policemen do make a difference in the treatment of Negro citizens and whites. Why is that so? That is so because they, be they belong to a majority race of people who in this nation feel that there ought to be a difference made between Negroes and whites. Uh, anybody in his uh, sane mind knows that in America we have made differences between white and Negroes for a long time, and the majority of the whites still feel Negroes are inferior to whites, and that they ought to be treated differently. Policemen are no different in this regard. I think the police department in Atlanta is working on the problem. We haven't cured it by any means. There are some policemen on our department here who haven't gotten the message yet that we are moving into a new area, a new era, and that they must themselves reorganize their attitude toward people. Uh, and when we talk about the hostility the police departments have, we've got to realize that I think most of these policemen feel they are representing the majority of the people in the community. I think in Atlanta, Georgia, when the police department knows that all of the citizens, including Negroes and whites, do not condone any of the skullduggery which they may engage in, it will stop. It will happen in Detroit when white citizens support other citizens in that city seeing that policemen deal just with all citizens, you will not have the same kind of problem. Now, Rep anybody... Reverend Williams, yes. time, is, time is running out on us. We're going to get back to you, I hope.